Hello, everyone. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Um, yes. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the sharing and replicability of notebook-based research on open uh, testbed session. Uh, my name is Joanna Nakfor. Thank you for the introduction, Hugh. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, a uh, technical lead and maintainer for a project called Open Data Hub, which is an open source project that, ha that provides end-to-end -end AI ML uh, platform and OpenShift. Our guest today is Jason. Hey, Jason, uh, how are you doing? Um, a little introduction on Jason. Uh, Jason leads the development and operations on Camelon, which we will be Chameleon, which we will be talking about today. Uh, it's a reconfigurable experimental environment for large scale cloud research um, that has been funded by the National Science Foundation since 2014. Uh, Chameleon implements its bare metal provisioning and advanced networking capabilities using OpenStack, Ironic, and Neutron, and is a core contributor to the Blazor Reservation System. Uh, over the past two years, Jason has been interested in utilizing Chameleon to improve the state of uh, reproducibility in computer science experiments, in systems, networking, security, storage, and other topics that have historically been very challenging to reproduce. Um, in this talk, he'll discuss the current challenges in this field, and how Chameleon um, has built a reproducibility platform on top of Jupyter ecosystem to address these challenges. Um, everything he's about to talk he's he's about to talk about is currently in production. So I will open the floor for uh, Jason. I think you have slides to share um, and a little introduction um, presentation. Yep. Thank you. And uh, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Great. Then. And next question, can everybody see the slides? Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction, uh, Joanna. Um, as again, my name is uh, Jason and I'm talking about some work that we've done on the Chameleon testbed. Uh, Kate Cahey is the PI of the Chameleon project. Uh, and this work is about uh, yeah, reproducibility um, across a lot of different computer science uh, fields. And so the, the motivation for the work is something that we refer to as the reproducibility dilemma. And the situation is that the researchers um, are presented often with a choice between uh, two, two ways that they can invest their very precious asset for them, their time. On the one hand, they can invest that time in making their research more reproducible by perhaps documenting it, uh, packaging it, releasing it, or they can instead use that time to further refine their ideas, develop their work further, and publish more. It's perhaps not surprising that a lot of people choose this button on the right due to a lot of the incentive structures in place and the high cost of making work reproducible. And so the question then, or rather uh, before the question, the, at the same time, we also recognize that there is a problem where a lot of work is not reproducible. And that's not just a problem for computer science, it's a problem in, in many of the domain sciences. I would go as far to say most of the domain sciences. So this is a problem. And the question then is, what can we do to help researchers more easily package their experiments effectively to, uh, to resolve this dilemma by making it less of a, a cost choice to make? And so uh, when we talk about what we can do, and we have to sort of tease, a, tease apart what does it mean for something to be reproducible, and we uh, tease it into a few different aspects. The first uh, is you, at the end of the day, you have to have some code that you're running because you want to actually perform the experiment, which means running some code at the end of the day. Secondly, uh, the code is not enough because what you really also need is a well-documented process describing what is the code doing why it's there and how it's working. This is particularly important because if you just have the code, it might not be obvious that, um, oh, why is this piece of code here? Maybe this isn't actually necessary. I can make this more efficient. And so having um, the, the how and why is quite important for um, building upon other work. Um, all of that is well and good, but not very useful if you can't find these artifacts in the first place. So these things need to be discoverable. It should be easy to find artifacts related to a paper or to a finding. And lastly, and perhaps the most onerous part of this for computer science is you need an accessible and consistent environment in which to run your experiment. Um, and this is a problem kind of everywhere, but in computer science in particular, because computer science experiments often have very specific, not only software, but also hardware requirements where I 
desire, like I need to actually be running on a very particular um, set of hardware or in a very particular network topology with certain properties in order for my experiment to make sense. Like I, maybe I need a 50 node cluster with InfiniBand, for example. So there's a lot of um, difficulty there. And so we need to figure out how to take these pieces and make a whole picture. Um, we need to connect these disparate areas to sort of complete this puzzle. And fortunately, we already have a lot of these pieces in place. Uh, notably, we have the advent of computational notebooks. Uh, most people are familiar with Jupyter, but an earlier iteration of this that's still around is Mathematica, which uh, these are basically interactive documents that blend text with executable code. And they're a very powerful tool because they allow users to change the code and seeing how it influences the results as well as sort of serving as self-documentation. And um, they're proven very powerful and useful for research, research in a lot of different areas, computer science being no exception. Um, secondly, we've seen the rise of uh, what we call sharing services. One example is Zenodo. If you're not aware, it's a CERN provided uh, service that provides a highly durable and searchable open index of research artifacts. So you can publish code as well as your paper. Your code gets a DOI assigned by Zenodo, a digital object identifier that you can then cite and make it easier to find these artifacts. And then uh, the last and sort of most interesting one, and in my opinion, is uh, we have these open test beds. And I'm going to talk about what that means. But it's basically a way of bridging uh, the fact that you need to you, you want to run this code, but you need to run it on an accessible, consistent environment. And so open test beds provide um, a common platform that allows you to really deeply reconfigure your underlying environment. We're still missing a few pieces, though, and that's what the, uh, the work that I'm presenting uh, focuses on addressing. Before I get into that, I need to do a little bit of background uh, to make it more clear what we're talking about here. The first thing is there's this really interesting aspect of clouds that I think is sort of underappreciated. We call it the silver lining. You can read more about this in this article I'll link at the bottom here. And the insight goes like this. First, basically due to the, um, it's recognized that what clouds do is they're um, serving a sort of discrete pool of hardware to a wide variety of users. But what this means is that fundamentally, everybody who's using the cloud is actually using the same instrument. An analogy here would be that we have uh, two different people using the same like microscope or just using a microscope at all. If you look at something through a microscope and you find uh, some interesting thing, you can send me the sample, I can look through my microscope, I should be able to replicate what you saw. And that's a very important property for science. So clouds kind of provide this at the end of the day because at, underneath the cloud is a, um, one discrete pool of hardware. The second point is um, due to the economy of the cloud, uh, all these resources are shared. And as a result, the access um, tends to be abstracted. What this means is that users are kind of forced to work within the parameters of the cloud environment and formalize their environment. Uh, the simplest example of this is you have to create a disk image that you can use to launch on the cloud. And the disk image maybe contains your dependencies that you have. Uh, the economy of the cloud also incentivizes people to make it so that they can easily reproduce their own environment because they are incentivized to tear down their resources when they're no longer using them. And so the cloud has kind of uh, incentivized people to already have to think about reproducing their work. The last point is that due to the, you, you no longer have physical access to machines, you're accessing the cloud through uh, network abstractions. And so all you really need is a uh, network connectivity. This really means that there's no technical barrier uh, for a truly open access cloud platform. Um, the question of access becomes more about policy of who is authorized and either by how much money you have or um, sort of what uh, standing you have in a host institution or something. So the point is, Clouds, by their very nature, actually can fulfill a lot of our baseline requirements for reproducible research. And this is important because Chameleon is implemented as a cloud. For people who don't know much about Chameleon, I'm not going to go over all of this, but um, there's a few important points. One, it's purpose built for computer science research. Uh, this computer scientists, as I said, have very specific needs around performance isolation. They want bare metal reconfigurability, access to low level hardware. Um, and uh, things like serial console access. And uh, 
So we provide this to them via OpenStack. We use Ironic as the bare metal reconfigurability. And it's also important for us to allow people to reserve hardware ahead of time. So we heavily use the service Blazor and contribute um, to that heavily as well. And it's been really great to operate on OpenStack. Um, it has given us a lot of benefits and it's also proven that you can actually build an academic cloud using open source tech, which um, we're pretty excited by. Lastly, um, it's been around for a while, started in 2014, and we just got renewed for another four years from the National Science Foundation. So we can continue to serve over 4,000 users and um, over 300 publications in the field. Last point I wanna make, um, we've also been able to leverage the um, OpenStack COLA and COLA Ansible projects to effectively package um, all of Chameleon as an installable thing that you can then use to um, install at your host institution to contribute hardware, um, both internally to your colleagues, but also to the wider Chameleon user base. And we envision this as becoming more of a federation in the future, currently deployed to three sites with more in planning and dev. So uh, just as a, so you can get a sense of the type of experiments people do on this platform, it's really wide ranging um, operating systems, virtualization, power management, um, AI, of course, is, is also being used more, um, more recently and lots of different networking stuff as well. Last bit of background, um, because it's important for the, what we've done more recently, we have had a Jupyter integration on Chameleon for the last two years. And the way this works is that you log in to a, a shared Jupyter hub if, with your Chameleon creds, and then you um, are brought into this environment that we've integrated into the test bed. So you can actually call the Chameleon test bed from a notebook uh, to do things like reserve nodes, provision resources, and so on. And this has been really interesting because it's a kind of non-traditional use of the notebook form in computer science. People are using these notebooks to kind of drive their experimentation by um, doing all these actions, setting up their nodes, maybe doing a network experiment where you have to start some cross traffic on some node and start measuring something over here. And it provides one easy way to orchestrate all of this. So exiting background, uh, talking about what we actually did, the two pieces that we built, the first is what we're just calling import and export plugins. These are plugins that integrate directly into the Jupyter ecosystem. Um, and so they allow you from within the notebook interface to take a directory of files that maybe contain notebooks, scripts, and data sets, package them into some sort of thing uh, reproducible artifact is what we're calling them, and then send it off into some place. And then on the other side, you can take that thing and basically um, deserialize it back into Jupyter uh, and you know import it as a new um, working directory, a new notebook. The place that you put them, we're calling Trovi. Trovi is very similar to a sharing service, but it's kind of specific and it has deep integrations with Chameleon. It's a browsable directory of these artifacts, and notably, it allows you to reinstantiate these artifacts with one click. It also has a lot of interesting sharing capabilities um, that I'm going to uh, talk about. So just so you can get a sense of what this actually looks like in practice, on the left, we can see what it looks like to package an artifact um, using this export plugin. You just sort of click a directory, uh, it uploads the files, you can add some metadata describing your experiment, your artifact, and then it saves it under your account in Trovi. On the right, you can see what Trovi actually looks like. It's on chameleoncloud.org right now. And um, you can browse public artifacts and you can also critically have the ability to keep artifacts private for works in progress or for getting feedback maybe from an advisor or a colleague. You can share people um, a private link and share them with the share uh, your artifacts with the group, sort of leveraging these very common sharing paradigms that people sort of find very useful um, when you don't necessarily want to make something public. So how all this looks um, is so I come to Trovi and I wish to uh, try out an experiment that somebody has published there. I click the this big green button. It takes me to Jupiter Hub which uh, we have a, some integration that understands I'm trying to launch an experiment. It spawns me a Jupyter Notebook server, imports all of the, um, the artifact files from Trovi into the working directory. And for then I'm good to go. I can use the notebook to um, invoke Chameleon APIs that the sort of experiment requires to maybe reserve some bare metal nodes and set up some stuff. 
And when I've reached a point where I want to save what I've done for, for review or for others, I can then export that again and save it either as a new artifact or as a new version of um, an existing artifact in Trovi. And then finally, if I wish to eventually publish this work, I can actually take that same artifact I was iterating on and um, publish it to Zenodo so I can cite it and so it has long-term um, sort of immutable storage. And so I'll leave you with a few thoughts. Um, sort of one of the in really interesting ideas that um, I'm interested in is the idea that we can improve, by, by improving researcher ergonomics, we can actually improve the state of reproducibility organically. And it's important to note that the work that we did followed a very human-centered approach. Uh, the initial inspiration for all of this was we had a, a summer student that was working with us in networking. Um, she was doing a PhD and she was showing us how she was using Jupyter notebooks to really um, orchestrate and keep track of her pretty complicated networking experiments. And we thought this is really cool. We should, we should basically make it easier to do this. And so we built the first version of the Jupyter platform. But then very soon people started asking, well, how do I share this? Uh, we didn't really have a great answer for that. And so we're like, well, we can build kind of something lightweight and um, to help facilitate this. And so we adopted uh, sort of common patterns from things like Google Drive to allow people to share private links and um, share with the group. Another uh, reflection is that we've we really benefited from a lot from building on what's already out there, what people are already using. OpenStack, as I've mentioned before, but um, for this, we're really um, tied into the Jupyter ecosystem and taking advantage of how um, friendly, I would say, in, uh, most of the time, <laughs> it is to uh, develop extensions within Jupyter. And also, we're building on Zenodo because Zenodo uh, has its core mission of sort of offering these citable long-term storage of artifacts. And that's really great to integrate with to solve that um, use case. Last thing I'll say, um, we've been seeing that research experiments in notebooks uh, is expressing itself over and over as a pattern. It's currently playing out in all, a lot of the domain sciences. If you look at Pangeo, if you're familiar with that, if you're not, check it out. Um, they're bringing this Jupyter pattern to um, a lot of different domains. And then we also have these other services like NextJournal, CodeOcean, and Wholetail that are more of a uh, general purpose hosted notebook reproducible platforms. And so I, I really expect that this is going to continue to evolve over time. If you want to learn more about um, anything I've talked about, there's a few links I highlighted. The first, if you're interested in um, learning about how to run a small version of Chameleon yourself or a big version, check out Chi in a Box. There's a, a GitHub repo that you can find for that. We also have a screencast that demonstrates a, a packaged experiment on uh, Vimeo, and you can find that. And um, lastly, there is a paper we just published in Usenex ATC 2020 that is kind of uh, looking back the last seven years of running a test bed of this scale um, with this purpose. And if you're interested in learning more about the thought process behind it, um, you can look at that. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing slides and um, hope that we have some time for questions. Thank you very much, Jason. This was excellent. Um, before we move on to questions, I'd like to introduce Andrew, which you see his really excellent uh, illustra illustration. He's our digital illustrator for this session. Uh, Andrew, I don't, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words about uh, your illustration, and then we can move on to questions. Hi, I'm a real person. <laughs> I'm not a robot. I just wanted to do that. Um, hi, um, I think I'll just leave it open to uh, the, the, the continuing discussion. Um, I've been listening for high level themes and stuff. I'm not a subject matter expert, but um, uh, Jason's uh, presentation was uh, quite clear, even for the lay person. Um, so I'll just continue to draw and I'll, be, I'll also be in the, um, the discussion uh, afterwards. All right, sounds good. Uh, Jason, I just wanted to kind of uh, reiterate that this problem of repeat repeatability of repeating experiments is uh, very um, is is very popular in also the machine learning world where you're trying to retrain your model or you're you know trying to retrain your model 
in the same environment and making sure that you have the right resources, memory, et cetera. So it's a very popular problem and there's a lot of gaps in there, especially with regards to, um, I would say the user experience for data scientists to be able to repeat their experiments and the lineage between the model and the data and all these things. So I had a, um, maybe if you can elaborate a little more, you um, mentioned something called Trove. Where is that where you store your artifacts? And the, what, what exactly are artifacts in this case? Sure. Yeah, we're calling it uh, Trovi, T-R-O-V-I. And um, it's something that is sort of integrated with the Chameleon testbed. As far as what an artifact is, uh, for us at a high level, it's just a collection of files. It's just a folder, basically. Um, and for... Usually though, it takes the form of a few things. There is a notebook that typically is used for people to set up their experimental environment on Chameleon. Because as I mentioned, like usually for our experiments that people are using, they, they need to um, request if some resources on Chameleon, spin up some servers and, and so on. And so they do that as part of a, a notebook. And um, also the notebook maybe includes steps where they're executing uh, SSH commands or copying files up there, or maybe running something like Ansible if they're really um, savvy. And uh, they might also have you know, critical bits of code that they're installing. Like if they're doing a test on configuration changes, maybe they have some config files in the artifact that you're going to be using and testing on Hadoop or something. So it really depends on the experiment, but um, Generally, it is at least a notebook and often a notebook in some supporting scripts and possibly data sets. Yeah, so that would lead me to my next question with regards to data sets. Uh, do you think uh, this platform will be adding more features with regards to data science workflows, um, specifically with connecting data sets to notebooks and then what model training? Yeah, it's interesting because our users are not data scientists specifically they're more people who are like interested in like there's somebody who's maybe looking at what's a better way to compress models so that data scientists upstream you know or downstream um, have more efficient workflows and so there is still a need to have access to data sets because you um, mm -hmm. anything research related it, yep. requires this so yeah the, the short answer is is yes we're not really sure exactly how we're going to do it, what's, what makes the most sense for our users, but having easy access and quick access to those data sets is going to be important specifically for our AI and, and ML researchers. Um, we also support a lot of different types of, of research. And so it's kind of, we have to sort of always thread this line between you know, not sacrificing too much for our networking users, um, but also serving the, these, these real needs. Um, and I also had a question with regards to, um, I know notebooks have code in them. And um, is there any way where this is tied to GitHub where you can get the latest and greatest code with regards to the artifacts? Um, yes, it can be. Uh, the, uh, the artifacts are not sort of explicitly linked to GitHub. Um, it is possible to sort of associate them with the Git repository being like, oh, like the code for this is also here. Uh, the artifacts themselves don't build on the Git model necessarily, although we do have some preliminary version support, but it's more like, you know, you have version support in Google Docs or something where you can have a few, a few history of versions. Um, the way people can and have used Git in an artifact is you, in your artifact, it basically pulls in that Git repo mm -hmm. and, um, you know, maybe installs it somewhere. But what we've found is that it's pretty hard to be prescriptive with these things because a lot of different people have different ways of working. And in our opinion, like the most important thing is that you can at least follow along with their thought process and their reasoning for why they um, chose to set up their experiment in a certain way. And it's often pretty hard to predict what specific needs they're going to have when it comes to their um, particular experiment and research. Okay. And you mentioned this is an open source project. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the, the components that that we wrote for Jupyter are open source. Um, I need to check if on one of them is. Chameleon is running on open source software. Chi in a box is open source. And so, yes, generally, yes, everything is. I will say that um, some of the stuff is a bit specific to Chameleon, so it might not be generally applicable. 
but I think that it's valuable to show like reference implementations of mm -hmm. yeah. how might you do something like this. And you did mention that it is available for someone who wants to download it and run it in their, on their own, uh, not on your own cluster or own uh, system. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Um, and then I had just the last question that I had is, uh, what are the challenges of actually maintaining a system like this uh, from regards of uh, monitoring resources and being always up to date with the re latest Jupyter Hub release? How hard or easy is it to onboard new users? Uh, yeah, I would say it's, um, in my experience, it's been much easier to onboard new users into the the the, pro, the, the application. Uh, dealing on the opposite side of the ops of running Jupyter is a, is a bit more difficult. It's gotten a bit better now because things have stabilized a bit more, especially yeah. with Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Lab. But for a while, it was like breaking releases every, <laughs> every few months. Um, and that's just sort of the price you pay for being at the, the edge, I guess. But uh, as far as monitoring, um, we we have a kind of interesting usage pattern at Chameleon because we we have a few we basically have a, a small amount of power users, and so we sort of have to figure out how to. Currently, what we do is we just monitor these notebooks because the, mm -hmm. the benefit of us of our platform is that the notebooks are not really doing that much. They're just used as like a jumping off point and an orchestration point, so they don't need many resources which has made it easy to set limits artificially on how much CPU and memory they're allowed to take so they don't overrun the system. Yeah, I can tell you we do the same thing with Open Data Hub for Jupyter Hub users. We limit their CPU and their memory, but they can, and that's why we limit, because they run distributed workloads that are training models and that could take up, I mean, they could take up a GPU and just hang on to it for a long time <laughs> before they release it for somebody else. So. Yeah, one of the things that we actually have done, we've run workshops successfully on Chameleon where it's like we have this uh, artifact that tells you, here's how you sort of deploy a Jupyter Hub for a workshop. And they can actually launch their own Jupyter Hub on one of our bare metal nodes that maybe has GPUs attached. And they can lock down that access to just workshop attendees. And then they have different needs about you know who can who's using GPUs and, and so on. So people who do need to do higher intensity work have, yeah. have a way out. Well, that's good. And then um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about uh, the upcoming features that you guys are working on? Is there anything exciting or new features that are being added? Um, yeah, one of the, so I think we're interested in developing more the computer science use case for reproducibility. And um, one of the main things that we're interested in is this idea of really building in almost like multiplexing support directly into the Jupyter kernel. Because it's often the case that if you're in computer science, you're orchestrating the experiment across the cluster, and you might want to SSH here and then there and then there. But this is kind of difficult to do. So we're thinking about ways that we can take that pattern and actually just um, embed it into the, the interface so that you're more intuitively interacting with um, the individual entities in your environment. And just another sort of following the thread of improving the, the ergonomics for our computer science researchers. How about adding more tools or other than Jupyter Hub notebooks like um, you know Spark for processing or any other uh, TensorFlow or? Yep, we I think so. Probably for that, what we'll end up doing is allowing making it easier for users who are interested in those type of experiments to get started. And the way we typically handle that is something called we call them appliances, they're basically templates. So like, here's how you can launch a TensorFlow application on Chameleon with all of the latest and greatest stuff. And it provides you a great template that you can then build on to do your experiments. And that's kind of the approach we take typically, as opposed to offering um, that inside the core of shared platform, if that makes sense. I see, more of a guideline of how you can do this. Mm -hmm. All right, we have, I think we're done with questions and we have few here. Thanks so much, Jason and Joanna. That was really, really very interesting. Um, reproducibility is uh, a, a huge and growing topic, as, as Jason said, not just in computer science, but across uh, research in general. And it's also really interesting to us at Red Hat from a, um, from a production standpoint, uh, because part of our business is making um, reproducible builds of software. And if we can't do that in a way that satisfies um, the reproducibility of a science experiment, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, so this, this is, it's all very, very interesting for us too. 
So we um, have Kate here. Um, Kate, maybe you want to introduce yourself a little bit and let us know what questions you have. Kate Kehi from Argonne National Lab, University of Chicago, and um, I'm the PI of the Chameleon Project that Jason was just uh, talking about. And and so I um, don't really have questions. I have a comment. Jason, excellent talk. And and also Andrew, those are wonderful drawings. Uh, Thank you. you. Know, if we can if we can put it on our social media or <laughs> publicize them, I think that you captured the various different concepts really really well well in a, in a very engaging fashion so I, I just uh, i just thought i would drop in i don't know if it's protocol to decloak ourselves for this discussion session um but i uh, but i i wanted to be here in case there are some broader questions about chameleon or anything like that yeah absolutely welcome um i think everybody who joins the session can turn their video and their audio on to ask questions so let me see I don't see, a, I'm trying to see how many people are in this session, but I can't really see, let me see if I can see something here. I think there was a question by who posted on the other session, but I, I missed it. Does anybody remember what the question was? He, he was asking if the Trovi system had an integration with um, Dataverse, mm. which I believe is a, another um, platform for storing uh, storing artifacts. And I just said that uh, we don't. Um, I haven't looked into Dataverse that much. I have looked into Zenodo, as I said. But um, I think with everything shifting so much in this landscape, it's always good to be aware of more things. So I think, you know, we'll take a look at it and if it makes some sense to deliver for our users, um, then, then we might. <laughs> um, so I think we, sh we have a fifth uh, person attending here. If you'd like to ask questions, please turn on your audio and video, just think it should be possible. If not, you can write it in the chat. Um, I had actually a question for you, Jason and Kate. I was wondering if there's any plans to uh, provide something like this on top of OpenShift uh, and then take advantage of all the OpenShift uh, functionalities and resources that it provides. I know it runs over OpenStack today and you probably do a lot of the functions to manage the resources. Um, mm -hmm. So one bit layer up would give you OpenShift, which is, has a lot more resources um, for scaling and for management. I think, um, yeah, so doing, so I, Kate might have more understanding about any sort of policy considerations that might go into this because I know that we're, um, because we're a National Science Foundation funded project, there might be some sort of technical or policy limitations. I would say technically, um, I think that something like OpenShift works well for this reproducibility platform. I wonder, um, maybe a question for you is, how would we allow users to provision bare metal in such a platform? And if to what extent is that, would that be possible? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely possible. Um, you, so when you have a new hardware that you want to provision, you basically write the code, I'd say the operator that actually presents this uh, hardware as a resource for all the applications to use. And that part of uh, presenting it as a resource for users to use would be on your end because you know the hardware is you have to write a lot of specific code to get it running. I mean it's running on the operating system but then you one level up would be OpenShift to present it as a resource for the users to use in their notebooks and their containers or in anything that they're using over OpenShift. I guess the other interesting thing that um, we have to to deal with um, is there's so Chameleon offers a lot of uh, advanced networking capabilities for research. Notably, um, we we have what we call these stitch ports, which are basically dedicated VLANs that are plumbed all across the United States on a network called Internet Two. And uh, it's nice to be so those are connected into our data centers in both um, in, uh, in TAC and in Argonne National Labs. And users use that in order to do wide area um, experimentation over dedicated links. And so. Yeah, that might be a little harder on <laughs> OpenSwift because it abstracts networking for you. You, mm. you do have an option 
if you are the OpenShift administrator, you have an option to pick any router or networking that you want, but then the users, uh, they have to have, I'm not sure the level of um, setup that they can use or the level of customization that they can use with regards to a network link, mm -hmm. uh, maybe between nodes or is that what you're saying? Or between clusters, hybrid clusters? Uh, oh, yeah. That yeah, that might be a that might be a little less customizable from a user perspective. From an admin perspective, you have a lot of ways of customizing it. I guess um, so. I I think that OpenShift could be an, an interesting choice, maybe for the for the the notebook platform that we we have because it has a little some of these has less requirements in here because it it interfaces. It could really live anywhere because it interfaces with Chameleon as a remote cloud. Yeah. But Kate, what were you going to say? Yeah. The sort of general answer is that we would have to explore the capabilities of OpenShift more and really understand uh, which part of, of the system it works with. And um, do you know of other examples of people using in configurations with OpenStack and and how that specifically is used? Um, so the so interface open between OpenShift, right? yeah, I don't know of any examples of, I know it. OpenShift and OpenStack run over on top yeah. of each other, but I don't know spe specifics on how to do it or an example, but I know we do it internally. Um, yeah. And there are system admins that know how to do it. <laughs> I'm not at that level, I'm higher. It's the, the, the answer to your question is the cost benefit equation for us, right? What specific features we could provide. <sighs> Uh, uh, wonderful uh, OpenStack contribution to the world, right? Called Collansible that, uh, yeah. that we started using uh, in our OpenStack installation, and that really went uh, amazingly well. You know, the, that 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 was something that allowed us to um, streamline our operations and reduce the operational costs for our community very very substantially. So, um, if if there is, I, I think that. In, from our perspective, this is perhaps a, a, a more promising example to explore collaboration to understand what else we could do on top of things that um, enhance OpenStack in, in those ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, um, you probably already know OpenShift, there's an open source project called OKD that is free to download and install. And there's also Kubernetes, which is OpenShift is based on. It takes Kubernetes and builds around it a lot of different features. Uh, but yeah, it depends on, I would say, uh, I, I understand that today, uh, maybe Chameleon uh, as a outside your network is probably not being used by a lot of other research uh, teams or other universities, maybe uh, when it picks up and you have other um, other universities using it and utilizing it, then you'll see what their requirements are and it fits, you know, it fits within the realm of, you know, we, we know we have a lot of customers here that are moving to Kubernetes and OpenShift and that drives a lot of how the, our applications are built. So um, same with Chameleon, if you see the drive towards universities adapting Kubernetes, adapting OpenShift more, then you'll probably uh, be more uh, focused on actually investigating that. As far as the needs of our community, I think we've got almost 5,000 users at this point. Uh, an open platform, right? And it's, um, uh, it's a nationwide um, uh, test map. So we try to always discover phase three of Chameleon that recently extended for another four years, um, we are approaching a community that is using uh, Internet of Things type devices yeah. and um, researchers who will be running experiments across uh, IoT and cloud, right? So um, that might be a possible um, opportunity for us to use Kubernetes more yep. perhaps, um, or uh, other lighter weight solutions that are more congenial to those researchers. But, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're going to have to see how that when we start supporting actual experiments, right? For now, uh, our extended version of OpenStack, which has those stitch boards that, that JSON uh, supports various sophisticated networking experiments, works well for everybody right? yeah. as, as we add new use cases from uh, from other branches of science we may need to define it 
require that we may we may well define additional requirements. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for OpenShift Hybrid Cloud, which is hosted and on-prem, uh, we have a lot of tools for that. And then IoT and AI on the edge, uh, basically being able to customize OpenShift to be deployed on the edge in smaller um, footprints of machines. That's another thing that we have and we're working on. Um, and actually being able to do inference on the edge is another big topic for us. I think, yeah, so I would say there are, um... We have been looking at Kubernetes um, sort of, you know, off and on, like as it's evolved as a platform. The really, the tough nut to crack with Kubernetes for us is that we're kind of serving the community of people who are building Kubernetes. Like they're, they're the ones who are sort of like <laughs> ar architecting like how Kubernetes work. Um, and it's a similar case on the edge and there's a, even more like weird wacky cases. And my main, um, I would say like currently the concern technically with Kubernetes for serving our users is it, it just doesn't support a lot of the stuff that, that they need. Um, notably, the last time I looked and I keep checking back every once in a while, the, the state of, of bare metal reconfigurable support is is not really there. Yeah. It's... Um, and I, I don't know that it ever, make, I'm sure it will be there at some point, but it's, I don't know that it's going to be there to the extent that we need it to yeah. because, because of the way our users use the platform. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting because on, on the one hand, Kubernetes is, is becoming such a shared language in a way that it it's, there's a lot of network effects you get from adopting it and providing it. But uh, that shared language doesn't really help computer science people communicate yeah. with each other currently. <laughs> so that's a, uh, it's, it's a tricky, it's tricky thing. Um, I I, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I can understand uh, the need of uh, not having another abstract layer from your actual bare metal hardware. <laughs> right. Makes things more hard, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's some really just uh, some experiment things that people run on Chameleon that uh, just you can you could never do on a on a commercial cloud or a container platform. Like, for example, we've had users who are running very, very sensitive performance analysis experiments. And their, their measurements are so sensitive that they need to make sure that they rerun on the exact same server blade inside of a rack um, to make sure they get rid of any, um, they're not susceptible to interference by oh, yeah. just natural, natural variation in, in the chip. So there's like, that's a weird use case that, you know, clouds don't really afford. Uh, there's also, um, I mean, there's a lot of other like uh, weird networking ones, but just another thing I can think of, it's not something that you can do on Chameleon yet, but it's a use case we're exploring for the edge. Like actually at the University of Chicago, they have this wireless sandbox, security sandbox. So it's it's literally a room in this uh, in the computer science building that has all of these consumer IoT devices plugged into a, um, a sort of walled off network because it's assumed that they're insecure. And there's people who are doing experiments, basically doing black box analyses of all these IoT devices, seeing like how much chatter are they um, giving off? Like what are the, how much of your data are they actually sending out? Um, so they're doing man in the middle SSL, checking out what the payloads are. And this is a, an interesting resource because it's expensive to build and they've even got like a washing machine in there that's IoT enabled and all these weird things. Um, but we're like, so how do you take that and enable, you know, maybe somebody in, California to be able to run an experiment inside that lab so they can measure, um, you know, maybe their security detection framework against these devices in, in this lab. And so these are like the, the weird things <laughs> that uh, people are trying to do and what Chameleon is kind of purpose built to, to solve. Um, so it's, it's interesting challenge, but it makes it hard to, to find a single, uh, a single tool. Absolutely. Yeah, totally understand. Uh, and those case, uh, use cases are very interesting, by the way. Um, and you're right, they are used to build the bigger platforms that we see today. So absolutely. Um, any other questions? I don't think we have any other questions. So I'm trying to see here. So I think if we don't have any participants that want to ask questions, um, I think we can wrap this up unless you guys want to discuss something else. Ask me questions, maybe. 
Oh, I don't <laughs> no, I think I learned a lot about, um, I'm going to look into a lot of this OpenShift stuff now, because to be honest, Absolutely. I didn't know a whole lot about what was currently on offer. And, um, and you know, you can contribute back if, uh, you know, you see a, see a need that's not being filled up by the platform. You know, it's open source. You can contribute back if you're interested um, to help the platform be more versatile, for sure. Sounds cool. All right. So I think we can wrap it up. Andrew, uh, do you have any questions? Are you good? Uh, I'm fine. I'm gonna I'm gonna add some uh, some visual more visual elements and stuff. I'll share these. I think I could. I think there's some some gaps I could probably fill in a little bit, but um, I'll wait. I'll wait till I sort of do my sort of finish this sort of live portion, then I'll share it with you. We can um, do any tweaking we, uh, we need after the fact. Absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining and for an excellent session. And uh, I hope to see you on um, open source, <laughs> open shift world, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. thank right. you for moderating. Absolutely, it was interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.